Nowra is a city in the south coast region of New South Wales, Australia. It is located 160 kilometers southwest of the state capital of Sydney. It was also known for its farming community, the Hanging Rock Lookout, and its award-winning dairy producer, Unicorn Cheese. Unfortunately, now, even 15 years later, it's also known for the double murder of a Nowra Hill couple, Catherine McKay and Greg Hosa, whose bodies were found in barrels. On January 29, 2006, a husband and wife were cycling in the Tomorong State Forest when they came across two smouldering barrels. The sight of smoke wafting in the bush was almost guaranteed to get a swift response, particularly in the middle of summer in Australia. The two cyclists alerted the Rural Fire Service. The Rural Fire Service arrived at Tomorong State Forest near Nowra on the New South Wales south coast around midday on January 29, 2006, informing them that they had found a small bushfire burning. After dousing the fire, they found two 44-gallon drums smouldering. What awaited the Rural Fire Service was horrific. Inside the drums were the charred remains of two human bodies, almost destroyed by the fire. The victims inside the 44-gallon drums were the burnt remains of Catherine McKay and Greg Hoser, who had suffered slow and painful deaths. The damage to both of the victims was so great that the cause of death could not be established. Investigators found remnants of rope binding Hoser's wrists, fragments of brown tape around his ankles, and wire looped around his neck. McKay's remains were mostly just fragments of scorched bone. The couple lived with their 10-year-old son on a farm called Champagne Shires on the fringe of Nowra, where they bred and raised horses. It was around 2001 where they met the architect of their murder, Kim Leanne Snibson. Snibson was a smart, personable, and easygoing mother of two who loved dogs and horses. This description is not emblematic of a sociopath. Kim Leanne Snibson, a wife and mother of two daughters, kept her beloved horses in the stables at Champagne Shires and helped out around the property. When she fell behind on her payments, the couple were lenient, demonstrating a generous act of compassion. Things took a turn for the worse when Kim Snibson's husband, Paul Snibson, an army officer, left her and took her two daughters with him to Wodonga, 500 kilometers southwest of Nowra. Her friend, Stacy Lee Cadden, moved into Snibson's house to care for the animals. On January 28, after she had spent two weeks in Wendonga with the family trying to put her life back together, she drove to Nowra with her two daughters and left them with friends. She was very lonely at this stage and began to form a very close relationship with Hosa. This relationship eventually evolved into an affair. About 2.30am on January 29, 2006, approximately 10 hours before the bodies were found, Stacy Lee Cadden walked into the Nowra police station. He told police that a man and woman whose names he didn't know were tied up in a house at 14 Kalima Street, Nyara. He feared they would be killed and later said his motivation for telling police was, I can't live with that on my conscience. But he wasn't telling the whole truth. Kim Snibson, the owner of the Kalmia Street house, was arrested around 8am that day. About 2.30am on January 29, 2006, approximately 10 hours before the bodies were found, Stacy Lee Cadden walked into the Nowra police station. At that point, police believed they were investigating a kidnapping. However, after the grim finding in the forest, it became quite clear that they were dealing with a murder inquiry. Snibson had plans for that afternoon that didn't include her children. According to Kim, the affair with Hosa ended when she received a videotape and a note in 2005. Lee Catton said Snibson told him the tape was of people having sex with her while she was drugged and drunk. The tape allegedly included her and Hosa in a passionate embrace. This raises two very intriguing questions. Was Snipson blackmailed by the tapes? Or was her affair genuine and she was desperately trying to prevent this news of her affair making its way back to her husband? Two very plausible motives for murder. Snipson told Lee Catton that she wanted to give the culprits a flogging. But that was just one of her stories. In 2005, Andrew Fletcher said Snibson willingly objectified her daughter by telling him her daughter had been sexually assaulted and that the attack had been videotaped. She alleged police weren't interested in pursuing it. Snibson wanted Flentjar's help to scare the perpetrators and recover the video. Flentjar bought Snibson's story, saying he felt disgusted because it involved a child, and he agreed to help. There was no tape or evidence to support either of Kim's stories. Despite this, her thirst for revenge became murder. According to Lee Cadden, it was on January 28, 2006 that Snibson reminded him of the alleged videotape of the drug or drunk induced assault and said, we're going to bash them and tie them up. 
However, she didn't identify the targets. Lee Cadden said she left him at 14 Kalima Street and returned a short time later with Flint Jar. She'd taken Flint Jar up on his agreement to help resolve the alleged sexual assault of her daughter. Lee Cadden and Flint Jar didn't know each other, nor did they know Hosa or McKay, and they did not have the opportunity to compare the stories told by Snipson, a crucial element in the sequences of events that perhaps could have prevented this horrific crime from taking place. Regardless, time was now up for the victims. Snipson called Hosa on his mobile just before 5pm and asked him to come around to talk about horses. He arrived a short time later. Lee Cadden later alleged that Snipson instructed him and Fletcher to pounce on Hosa as he walked into the house. Lee Cadden said Fletcher, wearing a beanie made into a balaclava over his face, hit Hosa across the head with a lump of wood and forced him to the ground. Hosa was then hogtied. However, Fletcher had a slightly different version alleging it was Lee Cadden who wielded the lump of wood. Snipson gagged Hosa with a sock and they dragged him through the house to the bathroom and left him. At 5.26pm, Snipson rang McKay and asked her to come around to settle her husband down. McKay arrived a few minutes later. Lee Cadden alleged Flint Jar tackled McKay, hogtied her and put masking tape over her mouth. She was dragged into the kitchen. Flentjar and Snipson then left to buy some cleaning chemicals to remove the blood that had poured from the wound of Hose's head. When the pair returned, the three scrubbed the house. Flentjar then took McKay's car back to Champagne Shires and went home. He wasn't involved in what happened next. Back at 14 Kalima Street, Lee Cadden said Catherine McKay was the first to die. He recalled Snipson wrapping packing tape around McKay's nose, ultimately suffocating her. Then Snipson wrapped electrical fence wire around Hose's neck stood on his back and pulled the wire, choking him. The victims were then put into 44-gallon drums. After nightfall, Snipson and Lee Cadden drove to the Tomorong State Forest. There, they offloaded the drums and doused the bodies inside with petrol. Snipson lit the fire. Around midnight, Lee Cadden alleged he and Snipson went back to the forest. She had a few more cans of petrol and wanted to see if the bodies were burnt. She emptied the petrol onto the remains, urging the fire on, so there would be no DNA. While she was thorough in attempts to eliminate the forensic trail, she didn't eliminate the human element. At her trial, Snipson alleged Lee Cadden was the principal in the horrid acts and that she was afraid of him. Snipson said Lee Cadden had also told her that when she was out of the house, he had to tape up the head of Mr. Hose's wife, Catherine McKay, until she turned blue. Lee Cadden, who had just turned 27, was among three people who lured the couple to a home close to their horse farm beat them unconscious and tied them up. Lee Cadden told police that Kim Leanne Snipson, an acquaintance of Mr. Hoser and his wife, asked him to help her belt up the couple because they had filmed themselves performing sex acts on her. The ploy didn't work. Her claims were quite false, said New South Wales Supreme Court Justice Terence Budden. With the help of a third accomplice, Andrew Wayne Flentjar, Snipson allegedly tied up the pair and returned Miss McKay's car to the horse farm, picking up a pair of 44-gallon drums from the feed shed. It was only when Lee Cadden saw the drums being unloaded that he knew they were to be killed, Justice Button said. As he looked on, Lee Cadden said Snipson taped Miss McKay's airway shut and strangled her husband with electrical wire. She cried as she described the gurgling sounds Mr. Hoser made. The trio then took the bodies in Mr. Hoser's car to the forest, buying petrol along the way to help it all burn. The judge noted, There was no conceivable basis upon which her culpability could be reduced because she was, in some way, acting under duress, said Lee Catton. The judge found her story implausible and said her allegations about the videotape and child sexual abuse didn't contain a shred of truth. A pre-sentence report said Snipson hadn't demonstrated any level of remorse or concern for her victims. However, the judge said there is considerable room for optimism in the Snipson's prospect for rehabilitation. For detaining Hosa and McKay, Snipson was sentenced to 8 years and 6 months. For the murders, she received a sentence of 26 years. Lee Cadden also pleaded guilty to murder and kidnapping and was sentenced to 22 years with a non-parole of 16 and a half years. Flint Jar was found not guilty of murder but convicted of kidnapping and received 10 years with a non-parole of 7 years. In her victim's impact statement, Catherine McKay's sister, Marion, said the family were like animals caught in the headlights. I am struggling to find words for the numbness and traumatic feelings the murders cause a family, Marion said. 
The impact has been felt physically, socially, emotionally, and psychologically. Two human beings having lost their lives in quite horrendous circumstances, revealing a very considerable degree of callousness. It is inevitable that they would have suffered a slow and painful death. Catherine McKay's sister wept as Justice Budden detailed her sister's final moments and extended his sympathy to the couple's young son, who was left an orphan. Clearly no sentence which any court could impose could ever begin to make good that loss, he said. The statements by McKay's sisters talked of the devastating effect of the murders on the victim's young son. What baffled the judge was the absence of any credible motive for Snipson's actions. Kim Snipson remained silent on the true reason for such a diabolical and premeditated crime. She will be eligible for parole in 2030. For Kim Leanne Snipson, Champagne Shires was a perfect combination of all her fondest desires and life passions. Living next door to her dream made reality. It didn't take long for her fantasies of owning the property to become a perceived right. Snipson's greed led her to believe she deserved Champagne Shires, while her ego convinced her that she could have it, if only the current owners were dealt away with. So she dealt with them the only way she knew how. She had them killed and stuffed their bodies into barrels. The most frightening part about this whole story is the fact that Snipson lived, up until the murder, a very normal life. There was no prior history or reports of unstable or violent behaviour. No medical reports to suggest that she had mental health issues. Nothing to hint that at her core was a dormant psychopath. This inner psychopath became active once Kim Snipson was overcome by her emotions and became seemingly oblivious to the ensuing consequences of her actions. Thank you for watching. If there is a subject you like covered, please leave a comment below. Have a great day everyone, and I'll see you in the next one.